continue our discussion of the Pearl of Great Price. With us today are members of the Department of Ancient Scripture, Professors Michael Rhodes, Andrew Skinner, Joseph McConkie, Richard Draper, and I'm Robert Millett. Uh, perhaps one of the first efforts on the part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to bring together a collection of beliefs uh, would have come on the 9th of June, 1830, when at a conference, uh, first conference of the Church, it was decided by vote to receive sections 20 and 22 as what they call the Articles and Covenants of the Church of Christ. Those became kind of the missionary discussions. Those became the uh, the things they were to teach. Section 20 contains some organizational uh, matters and some great doctrines. Section 22, remember, pertained to uh, who should be baptized or rebaptized. Um, I know, Joseph, you've talked about uh, uh, the impressive things that are contained in Section 20, for example. Uh, What's, what do you think of? Well, there's certainly uh, a very strong emphasis uh, on the Book of Mormon. Uh, really, verse 5 is uh, an allusion back to the first vision, and then with verse 6 going right down through verse 28 is uh, a testimony of the important role of the Book of Mormon, including those uh, that wonderful phrase, by these things we know. And then come a whole series, series of doctrines. Of doctrines. And, and it's saying because there was a Book of Mormon, because our faith is founded and based there, we know these great and singular truths, including, uh, in fact, starting with, that there is a God in heaven. And that's a very uh, significant announcement. We're, we're not saying we know there's a God in heaven because of Christian history or, mm -hmm. or for some other reason. We're saying it because we have the Book of uh, Mormon, because there was a first vision, because of the revelations of the Restoration. Okay, so you have a listing of doctrines. <clears throat> that would probably be one of our first collections of this is what we believe, this is what we teach. Um, I was interested to read in the, the Prophet Joseph Smith's preface to the 1835 or first edition of the Doctrine and Covenants the following statement. There may be an aversion in the minds of some against receiving anything purporting to be articles of religious faith in consequence of there being so many now extant. But if men believe a system and profess that it was given by inspiration, certainly the more intelligibly they can present it, the better. It does not make a principle untrue to print it. Neither does it make it true not to print it. The church was evil spoken of in many places, its faith and belief misrepresented, and the way of truth thus subverted. By some it was represented as disbelieving the Bible, by others as being an enemy to all good order and uprightness, and by others as being injurious to the peace of all governments, civil and political. I'm interested in the prophet's description. It does not make something untrue to print it. And I, and I really like where he says, uh, if we can present our message in an intelligible, organized way, what we believe, so much the better. Well, too, and he's coming out of uh, out of an entire historical period where they were trying to do that. In other words, it's no longer the catechism. What they're trying to do is get away from that and be able to define very succinctly core beliefs. So there, there's a history of this trying to just pin it down in a way that is very intelligible for other people to understand who we are and what we are. Okay. Um, there were several efforts through the years, uh, as we know, to bring together a statement of articles of belief or articles of faith by such persons as Joseph Young, Oliver Cowdery, Orson Pratt. Mm -hmm. Orson Pratt had 13 or 14 articles of faith. Uh, um, Let's come down, though, to what we have in the Pearl of Great Price, given as the uh, Articles of Faith listed there as a part of the tail end of the Wentworth Letter. The Wentworth Letter written to John Wentworth, editor of the Chicago Democrat, um, presumably for a friend who was preparing a history of New Hampshire. Uh, here we have, uh, what do we know about this Wentworth Letter? Let's talk about it for a minute. What, what do you think of when you think of the Wentworth Letter? It's uh, one of the first times that Joseph Smith actually, in narrative form, 
relates his history okay. you know, from from where he begins and actually pushes right on through to that, that particular day. The history of the church over which he presided, the mm -hmm. historical period over which he presided. Well, it begins with the uh, telling of the first vision mm -hmm. and then the coming of Moroni. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a significant thing because uh, I think we've been given a misimpression by uh, some that uh, <clears throat> we weren't up front in the telling of that story. Of the first vision. But here's Joseph, a very natural uh, uh, opportunity to say, where do we stand? What are we? Where does it come from? And he starts with the uh, first vision. We're going to lay our foundation there because, uh, because it rests there. And in fact, it's a very beautiful recitation <clears throat> of the first vision. Yes. Details there that we don't have anywhere else, including and, the simple detail of, they told me that eventually the church would be restored through me. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the expression exactly re uh, resembled each other in features and, and likeness. Yes, the father and in and the reference son. to the father and the son. So, and, and, and he follows with the with the coming of Moroni, and again gives you some detail that you don't get in any other source. So then, it's no accident that uh, that in the Articles of Faith, the very first one is the nature of the Godhead, sure. because Joseph learned that for himself follows in the sacred the grove. Yeah. And so at the end of that uh, document we call the Wentworth Letter, one of the great documents in our history, you find these 13 unnumbered statements of belief. Since that time, there have been a few little changes here and there, uh, editorially, but read basically the same as they did in 1842 when this document was prepared. Let's, uh, let's look at the Articles of Faith. First impressions. One of the things I think we we could say, and that is, as they come out in the first edition of the Pearl of Great Price, they aren't articles of faith. They're just simply there. Just statements of belief are just listed right there. Probably should acknowledge, uh, thank you, Richard, that uh, when the Pearl of Great Price is first organized by Franklin D. Richards, the articles of faith are there. Yep. When it's first uh, canonized, when the Pearl of Great Price is first canonized in, what, 1880, mm -hmm. it's they're there. But interestingly... There seemed to be some question in the minds of uh, Latter-day Saints over the years as to whether the Articles of Faith was part of that canonized collection, and so it was redone in 1890 and... Uh, and again in 1892, just to make sure that everybody knew that this the Articles of Faith and part of the canon of Scripture. Mm -hmm. And by that time, of course, they've, they've come up with the name. By 1880, we've got the Articles of, of Belief and so on, and then by uh, 19, uh, 1890, why we've got the Articles of Faith as, as it now stands. And some people have tried to compare this to a creed, and I, and I don't think it's a creed. How does it differ from a creed? Uh, well, certainly it's not recited by members of the church uh, during any kind of uh, worship service. It's not uh, part of a litany that that we you know recite. And, and certainly the chanting of the Articles of Faith doesn't do anything particularly to bring a person into a spirit of, uh, no. of mysticism. Particularly if you were chanting. Especially, right? especially if I were chanting it, that's correct. Uh, first impressions. As I say, although we do uh, habitually have the uh, people when they graduate from primary, the bishop will have them recite one of them. And just as a well, but it is very, very helpful to know in succinct statements a summary of what you do believe, as the prophet Joseph Smith said. As little children are asked, well, tell me about Mormon as I remember growing up in the mission field. Tell me what you believe. Well, I had a ready-made answer in the Articles of Faith. They probably sounded rather rote in, in my recitation, but at least they understood the fundamental principles or ideas associated with Mormonism. Okay. How about the layout of the Articles of Faith? We know there are 13. We have Joseph Smith's name attached. Uh, is there any order in which uh, can, you, can you perceive an order? I don't want us to necessarily read the prophet's mind, but is there an order you see in any way?